How to Train Your Dragon was a trilogy of movies I had not seen until you all screamed at me when I mentioned I hadn't seen it. I'm happy to say that Kayla and I sat down and watched the full trilogy, and today I want to review all three of them each getting their own segment. Getting into this, I only really knew the bare minimum about this series. I knew it was about a kid who ended up with a dragon named Toothless and convinced his family or tribe that dragons weren't all that bad. And I actually thought that was going to take the full trilogy to do. I thought that's what the whole story was about. I was wrong. And instead, we got a trilogy that actually was thematically really well done, not only on the each individual movie basis, but as a trilogy as a whole. And I think that's a large contributing factor to why just so many people would call this the best animated trilogy of all time. I personally don't think it's that good, but it is still way higher higher than where my already high expectations were going in. And let's get into exactly why with the first movie, just how to train your dragon. We call it the controversial opinion alert. This is the weakest of the trilogy. It's still damn good, but I just preferred the second and the third. But before I get into that, I do want to talk about what I feel is the strongest element of the first movie, and that is going to be the voice cast, which consistently throughout the trilogy is standout awesome. Gerard Butler, Craig Ferguson, Jay, Kristen Stewart, so many of them are doing just sensational work and providing so much personality to their characters, which in some cases, just for this first movie in my opinion, is needed to make up for a lack of character given within the actual script. A great example of this would be with the character Astrid, who throughout the trilogy grows to actually be a fantastic, agency-filled, intelligent, deep character. But in the first movie, without the knowledge of who she becomes in the later films, there's not too much there aside from a decent realization of the strong girl trope who ends up being the love interest for Hiccup, our main character. And Hiccup is a show stealer. He is, again, a typical main protagonist type of the weaker underdog kid in the warrior society who, through using his sensitivity and brains, is able to elevate himself throughout the arc he goes through. It's been done to death, but Hiccup is a sensational example of it. And again, I I want to commend the voice acting here a lot. Jay brought so much personality and angst in a very specific tone of voice that this guy kind of just masters that made Hiccup really someone who you emotionally connected with and without a doubt the shining beacon of that emotional draw is his relationship with Toothless. The icon for this franchise, Toothless is possibly the most personality-filled dragon I have ever seen full stop. And that is comparing him to dragons that actually can speak English, which Toothless can't, at least not on, you know what I mean. He can understand convenient plot needy stuff, but he doesn't actually have a dialogue with you. Toothless just slam dunks over every other dragon and the brilliance of making dragons into these hybrid cat dog type personalities is so much fun. And while no, How to Train Your Dragon is not the first to ever do it, it is the richest realization of that concept that benefits the setting and the story to extraordinary effect. I would count Hiccup and Toothless with the best animal companion relationships in just all of fantasy, including books, putting it up there with Lyra and Pan, Dresden and Mouse, just as good, if not way better. Now, when it comes to the actual story of the first How to Train Your Dragon movie, which I probably should have laid out a little bit sooner for the sake of the structure of this video, but I'm a doofus. Hiccup is the son of a chief of a Viking-inspired village, although they straight up just call themselves Viking, so I guess you could just call it a Viking village, where it seems a majority of the culture has evolved around the concept of defending themselves and actively hunting dragons. There is a diverse set for types of dragons within this 
world and Toothless, the special dragon our protagonist ends up meeting, is the last of his kind, Night Furies. A specialized stealth type dragon, Night Furies are incredibly fast and have a specialty projectile that they shoot out instead of fire that is unlike anything else any other dragon can produce. Toothless also doesn't have teeth unless he ejects them, which gives him this ability to gum characters that out of affection without tearing them to shreds. And through typical beats of a similar setup to this you've probably seen a hundred times. We see that Hiccup is weaker than the rest. Of course, his mother was taken from him, meaning he is just has his relationship with his emotionally distant father, and he continually disappoints his father by not being the super strong warrior. But as he is going through his dragon fighter training, he ends up through one of his contraptions injuring Toothless, who crashes in the distance where Hiccup goes off to claim the body of the Night Fury he has claimed, bringing honor to himself, but the Night Fury is not dead, and Hiccup begins bonding with the creature instead. Now, the wound he inflicted on Hiccup prevents Hiccup from flying without aid. Being someone who can invent contraptions, Hiccup actually ends up building a tail attachment that he puts onto Toothless, and as more things progress, he ends up with the dragon as a best friend and flying with him in some truly brilliant Oh, realizations of flying on a dragon. Something so many of us have wanted to do. Ha, ha, ha. And having not actually watched these scenes before, I can see how so many people who have had to choreograph dragon flight scenes, whether in live action with VFX, of course, or in animation, have cited these movies as their go-to research point, how to properly uh, visualize and have the reader go alongside with a main protagonist in a dragon flight adventure. I have not felt wonder like that in so many years. Very specifically, it brought me back to a childhood memory I have of the first time I read Aragon and how I imagined riding on Saphira's back. How to Train Your Dragon brought me back to those moments in a way that just made my cheeks rosy. Oh my god. And that is despite the fact the first movie's animation at its best looks damn good, but it has some shots and moments that look really bad. Fortunately, all of these flight scenes are among the best. It's more or less just like small close-up shots of character faces within the first How to Train Your Dragon movie that you have some stuff where it's like, that is hair, I guess, okay. This is much better in the second movie and nearly entirely gone in the third. In fact, the animation in the third movie uh, is gonna be a large point of praise when we get there, but let's rewind on back to the first and as Hiccup's training continues as a dragon slayer, he uses his uh, knowledge base that he is gaining through his relationship with Toothless to actually like tame dragons within the ring instead of killing him, bringing him much praise among the society as they are not really reading into the fact that he's unwilling to harm dragons, but just seeing on face value that Hiccup has this control over dragons that is remarkable to a society that has viewed them as such a threat. So it's like, oh, a new way we could possibly fight back. His father, even gets to a point where he is ready to just start celebrating Hiccup and bringing Hiccup the praise he, of course, has been starved for as a child. But in a final test where, oh my gosh, Hiccup is the best of the class, that means he must actually kill a dragon in front of everyone, Hiccup, of course, refuses to do so, now being so closely bonded with him. And then he is put in danger and Toothless comes to rescue him, exposing the relationship that Hiccup and Toothless have together. There is a final confrontation where Toothless is captured from from Hiccup and used to guide an attack on where the dragon stronghold is. Hiccup comes to try and save Toothless with some friends that he has made within his class. And together they are able to free Hiccup just as a gargantuan dragon who has been exploiting the lesser dragons to bring it food is revealed to the attacking Vikings and a truly epic battle begins. And honestly a battle that, especially for some of the weaknesses in animation that were prevalent throughout this first movie, uh, was tremendous. Like, I really felt this among there with, like, some of the best fantasy battles I've watched in animation. Like, it's really cool seeing the Vikings, like, storm a beach and, like, the dragons come out and flying around with this tremendously large dragon. It didn't look perfect, but it had this level of weight to it that really felt like high stakes and 
wonderful. And I really thought some major characters might die here. Like this series does show death in like an off screen way, though it avoids showing dragon slaying so aggressively that will be something you inevitably notice. But a consistent strong point to the How to Train Your Dragon franchise is a realization of action. Not even necessarily in like the battle sense, but these action flight scenes or the scenes where Hiccup and Toothless are just trying to start interacting and there's, there's some lunging and snipping. All of it felt so well done. And whoever was just working on the choreography throughout this movie really understood what works well in animation and what the medium's advantages are over live action to take what seemed to be an already kind of stretched budget. And at the end of the day, it's all solid enough to overcome any of the weaknesses here. And with Toothless, Hiccup is able to conquer this superior dragon. And the Vikings then realize that they can work alongside with and be friends with the dragons now that they are no longer being exploited by this super uber dragon and we get this a little too whimsical happy ending though with some high stakes hiccup has lost one of his legs he is welcomed within the uh, tribe and the culture seems to a little too easily shift over to being very pro dragon despite all of the ptsd these people might have when it comes to being around these creatures due to all the horrific death they're lives. We're not going to talk about that. Moving on. <laughs> I'm giving the first How to Train Your Dragon a 7.5. Rough edges, but where it's strong, it is rock solid. Dragon scale solid. <laughs> And here's where I want to take a minute to talk about supporting characters in the How to Train Your Dragon franchise, because while I don't think all of them are as hilarious as the movie thinks they are, or as deep as some fans seem to think, they are phenomenal examples of how to set up strong personalities around your central antagonists and protagonists, and also provide plenty of opportunities through their characterization to believably advance the plot. Craig Ferguson's Gobber, Jonah Hill's Snoutlot, Kristen Wiig's Roughnut, Kit Harrington's Eret, Kate Blanchett's Valka. All of these voices lend so much to the immersion of this story. Many of them are much older voices realizing younger characters far better than I've seen in recent memory. All of that before getting into Jaiman Hansu's absolutely charismatic brilliance as Drago. Great villain voice acting. In my opinion, 95% of the time, needs to have some kind of charisma buried in the darkness to make it stick in your brain and have a draw an appeal to them that even in their most terrifying moments continues to pull them in and drago wow might be my favorite voice performance of the whole franchise it's so solid so personality filled without ever feeling a little too over the top possibly only topped by the villain in the third movie but we'll talk about that when we get there though also special mention to gerard butler's stoic he's just Mwah! in this movie though we see drago the villain set up as a dragon hunter and trapper and so of course hiccup and his community of dragon lovers end up in conflict with drago after after meeting some dragon hunters that end up as friends along the way. And once again, the action, especially kicking off this movie, is just so bar raising. Even today, it stands toe to toe with some of the best action sequences I have ever seen from Disney or Pixar. And that's all these years later. I just can't get over it. From things as simple as dragon flight amongst the clouds to crashing and dodging arrows and on foot hiccup and Astrid against the dragon riders they have conflict with and the setting it up with like arrows and stuff around. Yeah, you kind of end up thinking how terrible of shots these guys guys are, but at the same time, like, Hiccup's costuming has evolved to show just how into the dragons he's become, which is the level of detail how the Trainer Dragon is consistently benefiting from, from showing the dragon hunters having this more rough tribal garb, to then seeing Astrid have her own slight bits showing how much she's fallen in love with dragons as well. There is storytelling in the details to How to Train Your Dragon that even if you don't consciously realize it, your brain does. And the second How to Train Your Dragon movie, I also believe is the best structured and paced of the whole trilogy. I think the first movie is a little too simple for me to feel like the structure is anything special, whereas the third movie, its biggest weakness might be that it drags on, certainly at some points of the weaker storyline in that movie. I think my biggest criticism would be maybe the end action set piece is a little too similar 
to the first movie. Well, granted, the action set piece is kind of split into two. Though the emotional impact of what happens in this film is awesome, because we see Hiccup actually end up reunited with his mother, who is not dead, but was taken away by dragons and actually became a dragon rider in her own right. After reuniting with her through finding this home of dragons with Toothless, Hiccup then is offered to go away with her and just work as a full-time dragon tamer forever. Not tamer, uh, explorer, discoverer, mapping the world, which is something that's set up quite well in this movie as being something that one, Hiccup does enjoy doing, but is also using as something to avoid his responsibilities as the son of the chief, which is probably the best thematic through line for his character of the whole series. The third still does a really good job, but the second How to Train Your Dragon movie is the best character growth for Hiccup by far because the movie doesn't back down from really leaning into some of the more interesting angles of the life he's having to learn to balance. And that's because not only one is he very hesitant to take on these responsibilities, but he feels like there might be something more or greater for him out there, which is a typical setup that you don't see the ending of this movie actually kind of aligning with typically. And this is where How to Train Your Dragon really starts to show some ambition in its storytelling beyond just a really great premise from the first movie. Because while giving so much more personality and agency to characters like Astrid, we watch Hiccup, especially through the lens of the people around him, grow into a more leadership type role. And a lot of those angles to his character solidified through his own solo endeavors, where he becomes a little more jaded to the outside world, which is a pro appropriate for someone in his leadership position because the big conflict between him and Drago is that he wants to just go talk to him. He's convinced that he is someone who can just talk someone out of a life of hatred and this does not go well. In fact, Drago ends up discovering where Hiccup's mother is with her reserve of just super special beautiful dragons and an alpha who we are explained through a little bit of world building has control or dominance over other dragons. And in, yes, an action set piece that is a bit too much like like the first movie in my opinion, stakes for this movie are realized. Whereas in the first movie, yeah, Hiccup lost a leg. We actually see this giant alpha dragon killed in a really kind of impactful emotional moment for an animated Kins movie that made me go, whoa. And so Drago gains control over his own alpha, a massive dragon he had already tamed that then takes over all the dragons of this region. And to raise the stakes even further, Toothless is then put under the alpha dragon's control and then used as a weapon to kill Stoic Hiccup's father. Granted, it's not where he was first aiming, but Toothless shoots and kills Stoic, which of course makes Hiccup drive Toothless away, but very quickly he regrets it, just quickly enough for this plot element not to annoy me. Yes, it makes sense for a few moments for Hiccup to go, get away, get away, you just killed my dad, but that is not dragged out, and Hiccup just realizes he was under mental control, and it was not Hiccup's fault. In a weaker movie, this would have been a drawn out thing that would have been super annoying to deal with, with, but no, Hiccup just gets over it, understands, and remembers to trust his friend and not blame him, which matches up with the more mature Hiccup we've been getting this whole movie. And the added layer of heartbreak of Hiccup having just reintroduced his father to his mother and them having this romancing each other sequence that hit so hard, the amount of like sorrow I felt in How to Train Your Dragon 2 in just sensationally realized plot beat after plot beat was, oh my God. No. Well, this is my favorite How to Train Your Dragon movie. I respect the third a lot. The second, I think, is actually my favorite, especially on an emotional level. Whoa. And I really feel like the second movie is where the movements for Toothless were mastered by the animators. It really feels like he's constantly trying to communicate something with how animalistic he's being or how reserved, shy, the amount of expression they're able to pack into this wordless, toothless dragon is fantastic. And yes, with the alpha control and how that is portrayed and communicated, it is kind of actually really scary. It feels like this rabid animal all of a sudden, which carries in and ties in especially to the theming of the third movie, which we'll get into beautifully. And I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't mention the fact that yes, Astrid probably needed a little more depth beyond what we got in the first movie, but she gets so much more in the second and third and the relationship she has with 
Hiccup. I'm not going to confuse Hiccup and Toothless's name for this part because that'd be weird. Feels so mature, which I love seeing for younger characters. So often younger characters get into fights or disagreements when they are romancing each other that are just so ridiculous. But instead, we see both of these protagonists drawing strength from each other, understanding what the other one needs to hear. And it just felt like a genuinely great relationship to have on screen from ki for kids to learn from when it comes to treating your partner with respect and looking beyond the surface and truly understanding who they are. Ah, oh, name another kids movie that has a relationship in the front like that, I'll wait. But we then move the action set piece to Drago bringing his army of dragons and his super alpha to the Viking home village where he takes over and tries to force everyone under his control by assuming command of the dragons. But Hiccup arrives with his supporting characters once again and is able to fully regain control of Toothless who was captured after he pushed him away. Drago through his hubris believes he's going to be able to dominate Toothless into actually killing Hiccup but that is not the case and Hiccup through a plot beat you see coming a mile away is able to regain control of the dragon he loves and ah uh, is beautiful. And then Toothless takes on this gargantuan dragon in a showdown firing missiles and actually having his friends join alongside him, which fits right into the themes of friendship we've seen with the human side, now building into the dragon side, and they take down the alpha, then cementing Toothless as the true alpha. And with a little bit of hand-waving, we understand that Drago died, but we're not going to focus on that because kids movie. <laughs> <laughs> that is something that happens in How to Train Your Dragon more than a couple of times where it's like brutal murder. Just don't think about it though. Really well done though. I'm a criticism. I actually think like for a kid's movie that needs to have things like that happen for like the plot to be fully wrapped up. They handle it really well. I'm going to give the second How to Train Your Dragon an 8.5. It is super ambitious, remarkably emotionally resonant for a kid's movie. It actually develops its characters in some really impressive ways. It takes some characters who certainly needed more agency last time and pumps them up and has a villain who is a bit too one note, but through performance and just design still certainly sticks in the brain and serves the purpose they were designed for perfectly. And then we have the hidden world, How to Train Your Dragon 3, where we kind of come to a big thematic resolution in a movie that could have been tightened up a little bit. F. Murray Abraham, a actor who I never pictured much as a villain, gives us a vocal performance for an antagonist here that might actually outdo Drago from the second movie. This actor has a long career of great performances, but surprisingly their voice in How to Train Your Dragon 3 might be my favorite thing by them. Though if I have to criticize something for this villain though, it will be their setup. I would absolutely have just believed that this character was coming after these people because he just wants to with their relationship with dragons, but they add this plot beat of him being hired to do so with some people that doesn't really pay off in any substantial way narratively. It just seemed like an extra layer of convolution that didn't need to be there and could have been simplified to again make the pacing of this overall package a little bit smoother but if there was some weakness there it is more than made up for by once again the growth of our cast of characters and for the third how to train your dragon movie i really want to focus on toothless and hiccup the jump from the end of the first movie to the second movie i felt was like the perfect evolution of their relationship in terms of how it was shown to us they are much more physically affectionate with each other hugs and just kind of being able to tackle and play around, but it doesn't reach a level of full on like Pan and Lyra, where they're just perfect communication and understanding all the time. Whereas the third movie now picks up another chunk of time later, and that communication through them still appropriately hasn't just reached that like flawless, they are connected soulmates as it shouldn't, but they still do feel like they are communicating and working together in just totally new ways that I love. And the wingsuit addition to Hiccup we got in the second movie and how naturally he just kind of starts using it here in the third movie. Brilliant. I mean, we already got like the weapons upgrade for him in the second movie and the third movie, oh my God, the animation. Never mind. let's just talk about how beautiful this movie is. This level of just beauty for the How to Train Your Dragon series, I would love to see to be brought back and redone for the first two films. I would absolutely pay to get like a box set of all three movies animated as 
as cleanly as this third one is. On a visual level, this is peak how to train your dragon. And I think especially the smaller touches in animation are what allow the relationship between Toothless and Hiccup to come even more to life. Throughout the movie, there are small gestures, jokes, and bits of understanding between them that don't ever feel like they need to be vocalized. They're just so into each other's personalities at this point that Hiccup and Toothless just almost feel like siblings. But again, it never has forgotten that Toothless is an animal and Hiccup is a person, which ties into the overall message of this movie and trilogy spectacularly. That is not a criticism, it is a praise. That being said though, before we get into all the thematic resonance that is achieved here in the third movie, I do want to talk about some more issues, especially on the writing side. I just feel like there are certain decisions made for the script that were only made to try and change up location a bit more for confrontations and showdowns, and as a whole just didn't fully make sense. Like the Viking villagers all just leaving their village behind to escape a fight and just run to a place they're not entirely sure is there without trying to scout anything, without trying to do nothing, aside from just flying off with what they can carry with the clothes in their back, they find an island, not even where they want to go, and just decide, this is better, let's make a new home here, even though we haven't achieved what we wanted to, we haven't fully escaped, and everyone's totally all right with you taking them away from their homes, okay? Just weird, like not like something where I can be like objectively wrong all the way through, but it just feels convoluted and odd. I get from a writing perspective wanting to change up locations, but with the mobility dragons are already bringing to the script, it felt a bit weird. I know it does align with Hiccup's character to want to avoid a massive big battle at his home turf once these people get there, but strategically it just seems so wildly awful to just totally abandoned fort and hope you can find a mythical place you don't know where it is. I, it does fit into Hiccup's whole I want to fully like explore the world thing, but it just felt so weird for every side character to go along with it and then to be so happy once they just find a nice island. But we do get more growth from Hiccup as a character, which I like when he goes on the offensive and wants to go take down Grimmel, this villain hired to come after them. And they end up in this kind of like espionage going for a mission that goes horribly wrong because Grimmel is drugging these dragons who are guard dogs for him. And our heroes narrowly escape with only one kept as a prisoner which they don't even realize until they're back home, which was another moment where I was like, wait, really? No one looked around? Like they try to pin it entirely on Tough Nut, but I'm like, none of you noticed Rough Nut was taken prisoner. And then relying on Rough Nut's stupidity, kind of doing like the escalation through sequels or continued shows that often happens with dumb characters, Rough Nut doesn't realize she has followed back to this island, bringing, of course, a kidnapping attempt where Toothless and his introduced love interest, the Light Fury, are captured. And Toothless and this Light Fury, again, a little odd for me, because we get that Grimmel is the one who introduced a Light Fury into uh, Toothless's life so that he would be distracted, but it's kind of odd how he's done it because he's just released this Light Fury into the wild and he doesn't seem to have any control on it beyond that. Aside from having a trap near where the Light Fury was at a point, it was kind of strange and the relationship of how that was set up or how he plans on fully executing it wasn't as clear communicated as I would have liked it to be. And it more just seemed like the writing was like, ah, let's just introduce a love interest for Toothless because we need to have a thing where we're gonna continue on the Night Fury legacy and Light Furies and stuff. That criticism said though, the actual realization of the romance between the Light Fury and Toothless was so sweet. And I love that she's like showing Toothless some stuff he may not know. And we see an evolution again of Toothless's powers. And before, of course, we have the arrival and the kidnapping of Toothless and the Light Fury. We even have Toothless having this narrative beat where Hiccup lets him go to live life with the Light Fury. And he's gone for a really long time, more than Hiccup thought he would be. So Hiccup goes searching after him and realizes is that this is where Toothless belongs in this other world they've discovered and been a part of the actual original place, the world where dragons are from. And this is when I began to realize what the concluding message of the How to Train Your Dragon trilogy was gonna be, and I was so happy to see it. But Hiccup and Astrid are discovered in this world, and they have to escape with Toothless's help, and it is after that escape 
that they end up being trapped by Gremmel. And then we have a pretty awesome final showdown where again, Hiccup and his side supporting characters gear up using their litany of tools they've developed through having this relationship with dragons, which actually makes the final showdown quite believable. I like their tech upgrades now that they have dragons with them, like the armor and the wingsuits and the swords, very cool. And of course, we have Hiccup freeing Toothless and a bunch of other dragons, and a action set piece where it ends up with Grimmel, Drugs, Toothless, and Hiccup are all involved in a final pursuit. Hiccup ends in a situation where he and Grimmel are falling as Toothless has been knocked out, and he tells the Light Fury to save Toothless and not himself. The Light Fury manages to save Toothless and swoop down and save Hiccup, Grimmel falling to his demise. And once again, brutal death through falling that we're just, don't pay attention, that's not horrific at all. <laughs> and then they return of the king it, and we have like several ending beats, but each of them pretty damn resonant and feel good for us, the viewer. Hiccup realizes that this world is just not ready for dragons and humans to coexist despite their society's ability to. As long as they have these dragons as companions, there will be people who feel threatened, who will come, who will cause harm. And so for that reason, Hiccup allows Toothless to take all of their dragons and all of the dragons in the world back into this ocean portal, which is such a cool concept concept back into the dragon world in a hidden location where they will be left alone until humanity has evolved beyond its brutish ways so that we are worthy of dragons. Oh, you love to see it. I love a humanity hasn't matured enough trope and how to train your dragon sticks the landing of that theme of our own growth and our own childishness needing to uh, be what develops, not the animal before us so spectacularly, so warm and fuzzy, I love it. But then we see Hiccup and Astrid finally get married, which is a beat that is hit on between them or repeatedly in this movie, and we fast forward to seeing them with kids, and Hiccup and Astrid take their kids to the entrance of the dragon world, where it just so happens to be that Toothless and the Light Fury are there as well with their children. And the final shots we get in this movie are all of our favorite characters flying around with their children and dragons, and it's so goddamn perfectly sweet, mm, with that tiny touch of salt to make the flavor just mwah. That salt being humanity's not good enough for this magic, you son of a bitch. And one final point I want to add here, as the movie's theme kind of ties together all three movies, this is one of the cases where I believe the sum is better than its parts, while the parts are still really solid. The trilogy is worth admiring due to how it treated not only its characters, but its audience with maturity and grew with them a substantial amount in just three films. Overall, I think this is far better than I had my expectations going in, despite how much you guys hyped it up. And I'm really happy to know there is a trilogy out there like this, and am somewhat dreading the news that we are apparently getting a live action adaptation. This series benefited so much from the medium of animation, I just find it hard to believe in the day and age of live action stuff, that is of course a lot of CG and computer like that, that we'll see anything that's some, even close to the visual beauty we have from the animated trilogy because these new animated films are, or live action remakes of animated films are so drained of color and personality when that personality that is so vibrant and toothless and hiccup and these side and supporting characters is at the heart of it. I'm just not feeling good about that now. And the final How to Train Your Dragon movie, I would give a solid 7.5. I am giving it some extra nice bonus points for just how beautifully it is presented. If it wasn't for that, it'd be a bit lower for just some of my own personal annoyances with some of the writing. But overall, I'm so in love with these characters at this point. It's genuinely funny. The action is thrilling and the villains are very villains. So as a whole, yeah, I'm giving the How to Train Your Dragon franchise a rock solid eight. Thank you everyone for pressuring me into going on this journey. I really, really enjoyed it. And yeah, I maybe regret not naming Mako Toothless, though Mako is a little bit better of a name for him. And I feel like Toothless probably has been done to death. But this has just been my thoughts on the How to Train Your Dragon series after watching them throughout the week with my girlfriend. And it was a 
a wholesome, wonderful experience. Thank you, everyone, and like and subscribe if you have not already. Hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here, and have a good one, y'all. Peace.